Hey Roots fam, it goes without saying that the United States is nearing the end of an election season unlike any we've seen in modern times. Not only do we have an impeached incumbent president who has worked very hard to sow doubt in the trustworthiness of the democratic election process itself, but we also have for the first time in American history an incumbent impeached president who, if he loses, refuses to agree to the peaceful transfer of power, which of course is one of the bedrocks of American democracy. Now, none of the experts who have closely watched all of this know for certain how this election season will turn out. But many are deeply concerned that we're heading towards a constitutional crisis that could have very destructive real-world consequences for everyday people. This uncertainty about the future of the American experiment is stressful enough without it being compounded by the out-of-control COVID-19 pandemic that has already killed over a million people around the world and over 200,000 people here in the United States. On top of all that, there continues to be a racial reckoning taking place in this country, a renewal of the movement for black freedom in America. Since the murders of Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and George Floyd. Now as a pastor, I'm very curious what Christians in the US are being taught in churches during a crucial time like this. So I've been paying close attention to the sermon topics and teaching series that have been promoted by churches that I follow. And I gotta say, I've been really discouraged because I've seen a lot of churches teaching that the primary challenge that American Christians face today is polarization and partisanship. It's been really frustrating to see a lot of churches suggest that the primary problem is that we don't understand each other well enough or we don't know how to dialogue anymore. These are great examples of why the religiously unaffiliated demographic, the so-called nuns, is rapidly growing and why the church in America remains just as segregated as it was 60 years ago when Dr. King said it was the 11 o'clock hour on Sundays that was the most segregated hour of the week. The problem is not just polarization or a lack of dialogue. A more fundamental problem is the pervasive injustice that is present in American society at a massive scale. In the midst of a global pandemic that is killing hundreds of thousands of people, it's unjust that millions of people in this country don't even have access to basic health insurance in the wealthiest country that's ever existed. It's unjust that people of Asian descent have been targeted for violence and discrimination due in large part to the racist rhetoric of the president. It's unjust that black Americans are disproportionately brutalized and killed by police in this country. And police officers who commit these crimes are rarely if ever charged or convicted. It's unjust that while we're focused on election politics, female immigrants and refugees are being abused and operated on against their wills in detention centers funded by taxpayer dollars. Not to mention the abuse of unaccompanied minors who've been separated from their parents. These are just a few of the examples of widespread heinous injustices that characterize this period in American history. But framing what we're living through as just a lack of dialogue or partisan polarization suggests that there is somehow two sides to these injustices, as if there is some reasonable explanation for them. But there isn't. And I would be committing pastoral malpractice to teach you otherwise. Instead, what I believe God would have us learn now is how the church can resist injustice in society and be a faithful witness of God's kingdom. The scriptures, the life of Jesus, the example of the early church, 
and the life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a modern martyr, modern martyr, offer us tremendous wisdom for navigating these perilous times. So that's why this week we're kicking off a new teaching series that we're calling Spoke in the Wheel, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Kingdom Allegiance. Our scripture text this morning is from the ninth chapter of Acts, and we're going to turn there in just a moment. But before we do, let's pray for the Spirit's illumination. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, would you shine your light of illumination upon the scriptures that we hear today? I pray that scales would fall from our eyes and we would see Jesus for who he is. May the word be like a seed that finds good soil. May it take up, may it take up root in our collective hearts and bear good fruit, fruit that will last. In the name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said, amen. If you have your own translation of the New Testament, you're welcome to follow along. I'll be reading from the NIV, starting verse 1, Acts 9. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he, heard, as he neared Damascus on his journey, Suddenly, a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street. And ask, him, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias replied, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. The word of the Lord. Now, in this story, Saul is portrayed as having power and privilege compared to Ananias. And his power and privilege isn't illegally used to imprison and murder people. No, he is authorized to do so by religious and political authority structures. This is a small glimpse of the positional power differentials that exist in every society. There are groups who've been afforded unjust advantage and legally maintain that advantage. They are authorized to wield that power, and they do. This is going to be very relevant as we begin to discuss Dietrich Bonhoeffer's life and what we can learn from it for our present context. A lot of people don't realize that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a very powerful and privileged person. It's not often acknowledged that Dietrich Bonhoeffer was raised in immense wealth and social privilege. A few weeks ago, I began reading a biography of Bonhoeffer's life, 
written by an author named Charles Marsh. The book is called Strange Glory. In it, Marsh recounts the huge mansions that Bonhoeffer's family owned in cities of Germany like Berlin, in addition to their summer homes in the countryside. Bonhoeffer's father was a renowned psychotherapist who chaired the Department of Neurology and Psychology at a prestigious hospital in Berlin. Just to give you an idea of the kind of wealth and privilege that Bonhoeffer was accustomed to growing up, listen to this description of his household from the book. Quote, With the help of a small army of servants, chambermaids, housekeepers, a cook, and a gardener, a governess for each of the older children and a nurse for each of the small ones, Paula, Bonhoeffer's mother, was praised for keeping a well-tuned, comfortable, and stimulating home. <laughs> the biographer, Marsh, also relates how Bonhoeffer was, when, when he was a teen, he proposed to his parents that he'd like to spend the summer in Rome studying independently. They, of course, sent him and funded the entire excursion with hardly any questions asked. Must be nice, right? Bonhoeffer was classically trained from a young age as a musician, and his family were not actually all that particularly devout Christians. Uh, it's said that they didn't even attend church very often. So it came as somewhat of a shock to his family when he decided to study theology as a career. Bonhoeffer was very smart and excelled in his studies, but his immense wealth and social privilege made his career path a lot easier to pursue. Like the fact that the famous German theologian Adolf von Harnack was a family friend who lived nearby when Bonhoeffer was just a kid. By the time Bonhoeffer was merely 21, he'd already completed his doctoral dissertation. And by 24, he'd been appointed to a professor position at the University of Berlin. By 27, he'd written a second theological dissertation. Now, obviously, Bonhoeffer wasn't somebody breathing out murderous threats against others like Saul of Tarsus. But if you understand the German context in which he was rising as a theologically prominent person, then you can see that his theology contained religious authorization for the use of of violence and injustice against minorities. You see, when Bonhoeffer was just getting started as a very young theologian, Germany had been decimated by World War I. Their economy was in ruins and they were nationally humiliated. And it's this place of vulnerability that Hitler exploited to gain power. Here's what ethicists Glenn Stassen and David Gushy write in their book, Kingdom Ethics, about Germany. Germany was suffering from the Great Depression. There was mass unemployment and civil unrest. Hitler had promised to get the economy moving again. He had also enticed Christians to vote for him by promising to make Christianity, quote, the basis of our whole morality, unquote. He assured Christians that they were, quote, the most important factor safeguarding our national heritage, unquote. He blamed Jews and communists for Germany's problems. Christians were flattered by Hitler's claim to support Christianity, and they lacked the biblical commitment to standards of justice that would have warned them against his unjust plans. Yikes. This is the context in which the young theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer began his career. And his initial theological foundations were actually quite compatible with the rise of Nazi ideology. Stasi, Stasen and, Gush, and Gushy go on to say this. In 1929, when he had just finished his graduate studies, he had based his concrete ethics on nationalism, like other Lutheran theologians who ended up supporting Hitler. He claimed that God had ordained the nation state to guide us in politics, war, and economics. In our social responsibilities, 
we should not follow Jesus, but the realities of German politics. Whoo! Dr. Reggie, Reggie Williams is a theologian and Bonhoeffer scholar and is the author of the 2014 book, Bonhoeffer's Black Jesus. In it, he starts to detail the state of theology in Germany when Bonhoeffer was getting started this way. The predominant expression of Christianity in post-war Germany was a malaise of Lutheranism, social Darwinism, and nationalism, fused with a triumphalist view of history described as God's orders of creation. Now, this concept of orders of creation was the doctrine that certain structures of human life, they aren't random or accidental biologically or socially, but they are deliberately ordained by God as essential and immutable conditions of human existence. This doctrine was directly used by the German Nationalist Socialist Party to support the ideology of white supremacy and Aryanism. They claimed that above all, the supreme order of creation is one's race, or what they called Volk, and that God had ordained the German Volk to sit atop the orders of creation. This was the same kind of theology that was used to justify slavery in the antebellum American South. Dr. Williams goes on to write, Bonhoeffer's system of theology was no exception to the norm. In his early years, his creative theology was seduced by the predominant expression of Christianity in Germany. The concept of orders of creation became a theological support for the Nazi language of blood and soil, or racial superiority, and a pure Volk. As a young theologian and pastor, Bonhoeffer spent a few years in Spain serving a congregation of German expats. And there are examples from this German Volk theology that show up, and the orders of creation theology, that show up in his sermons from that period. Now, I'm not telling you all of this to make you think that Bonhoeffer was a bad person. What I'm telling you all this for is to demonstrate that it's all too easy for people, even good Christian people, to get swept up into nationalistic fervor, especially when they lack hope. Hitler rose to power by exploiting the vulnerable state of the German collective psyche and promising to make Germany great again. Here's how Dr. Williams puts it. Hope for Germany's future included creating a narrative on which to hang their current experiences to connect their imperialist nostalgia with a vision of a brighter Germany tomorrow. Longing for Germany's glorious past framed the story of a recovered, glorious Volkier, the German race. But all of this began to change in 1930, when Dietrich Bonhoeffer spent a year abroad in New York to study at Union Theological Seminary in Harlem. This was during the Harlem Renaissance, when African Americans were expressing themselves in all kinds of new and powerful ways. The music and the poetry and the visual art from this period, period is stunning. It's, it's an anticipation of the civil rights movement that wouldn't happen for several more decades. During the Harlem Renaissance, African Americans celebrated their beauty, their power, their unique contribution to American society, and their unique expression of Christian faith. By the time Bonhoeffer arrived in Harlem in 1930, he had already begun to grow disillusioned with the kind of scholastic and dead orthodoxy of his theological tradition in Germany. And he was hungry for something new, a vibrant, life-giving expression of Christian faith, one that would move him to act in new ways. He was in search of what he called the cloud of witnesses, and a community under the gospel. This is what Bonhoeffer encountered at Abyssinian Baptist Church in Harlem, particularly in the preaching of Pastor Adam Clayton Powell. There, Bonhoeffer heard a message of hope that didn't center around modernity 
or the triumph of Western civilization, but instead a message of hope that centered around the person and the work of Jesus Christ. In the teaching and in the ministry of Abyssinian Baptist Church, Bonhoeffer encountered Christ in an entirely new and unexpected way. He encountered Christ among the community of those who were regarded as less than by the broader American society. And in it, he recognized the wisdom and the power of God. Saul of Tarsus would later write these words in which we can't help but think about his own transformational experience in that Damascus road. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the, pre the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Brothers and sisters, think of your status and how you were viewed when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose those considered foolish by the world to shame those considered wise. God chose those considered weak by the world to shame those considered strong. God chose those considered lowly by this world and those considered despised, and those considered nobodies, to expose those considered somebodies, so that no one may boast before God. It is because of God that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God, that is, our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let those who boast boast in the Lord. In the American black church, Bonhoeffer encountered the black Christ, the Christ who surprisingly and miraculously reveals the power of God through weakness and the wisdom of God through the foolishness of preaching the gospel. In the American black church, Bonhoeffer encountered the black Christ who suffers with and for his people. Jesus, not modernity, was the reason for hope within the black Christian communities like Abyssinian. Jesus was evidence that God knows suffering. If God was with Jesus and his suffering at the hands of injustice, then surely God is with black people who suffer in America. In Harlem, African-American Christians embraced the story of Jesus, the crucified Christ, whose death they claimed paradoxically gave them life. Just as God resurrected Jesus in the life of the earliest Christian community, Bonhoeffer found Christ existing as community where historically marginalized and oppressed black people knew Jesus as co-sufferer. And the gospel spoke authoritatively into all areas of life. Such a Christian experience left its mark on Bonhoeffer. One Sunday, after returning from church at Abyssinian, a fellow seminarian and friend noticed a dramatic difference in Bonhoeffer. He was normally very stoic, non-emotive, but this Sunday he returned excited and clearly very emotional. He was deeply moved by the spirituals that were sung and the way that the whole congregation 
shared in the experience of the preaching of the word through their participation. The fellow seminarian recalled, Perhaps that Sunday afternoon, I witnessed a beginning of his identification with the oppressed, which played a role in the decision that led to his death. Now, I think it's generally true that we are most often transformed through encounter. And perhaps the most profound transformation that we can undergo through encounter is the transformation from apathy to empathy. It's incredibly ironic that Bonhoeffer had written brilliant theological dissertations on how Jesus is our vicarious representative who gives his life for us. In fact, Bonhoeffer had a theology of Jesus that highlighted his identification with our humanity. And yet, he couldn't see how that identification with our humanity, even our suffering, completely undermines the orders of creation theology that claims that oppressive social structures are ordained by God. He couldn't see it. He couldn't see how his theology justified injustice. He was brilliant and blind, just like Saul of Tarsus. And he writes, I had plunged into my work a very, in a very unchristian way. Then something happened, something that has changed and transformed my life to the present day. I had not yet become a Christian. To understand Bonhoeffer's transformation through encounter, we need to take a look, another look at this morning's text. Because it's crucial for us to recognize that this story of Saul's transformation isn't merely the story of his individualistic encounter with Christ, although that happens in the story too. Even more so, Luke's narrative of Saul's transformation points us to his need for the community of the disciples to touch his eyes in order for him to see. Saul needs tangible and concrete presence, the presence of Jesus among the followers of the way to welcome him in order to make him a fellow disciple. His transformation isn't complete until he encounters Christ in the community of the disciples through Ananias' healing touch. For Saul, Ananias and the other followers of the way were the nobodies. They weren't wise by human standards or influential or of noble birth. They weren't the religious elite like him. They didn't have the backing of the temple authorities. They were powerless. But that's precisely why God was with them. God is on the side of the oppressed, the marginalized, the outcast, the misfits. That's why in Matthew 25, Jesus identifies with those who are hungry, thirsty, needing clothes, the sick and the imprisoned. Jesus says that when we see them, we see him. And when we serve them, we serve him. When Jesus revealed himself to Saul on the road to Damascus, he revealed himself as the community of way followers whom Saul was persecuting. Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Jesus identifies with the community of the persecuted, the downtrodden, the disregarded, and the disinherited. And this revelation came not just through that encounter, but through the healing touch of Ananias, who's a persecuted disciple. And God's call on Saul's life was inextricably linked to the suffering that Saul would have to endure for Jesus' name. I hope this isn't a spoiler for you, but one of the primary reasons why we remember Bonhoeffer is because he was martyred. He died for what he believed. That to persecute Jewish people or anyone was unjust, and he stood with those who were being murdered. On April 9, 1945, the Nazi SS killed Dietrich Bonhoeffer at Flossenburg concentration camp two weeks before it was liberated by the U.S. Army. But long before he was arrested and executed, Bonhoeffer became a catalyst of a resistance movement in Germany called the Confessing Church 
that opposed Hitler and Nazism. In 1933, he delivered a lecture to a group of pastors who were a bit uneasy about the way the German state was exercising its power, but they were too apathetic to speak out. Before he finished his remarks, most of them had already left the room. Dietrich men mentioned three possibilities of church action towards the state. In the first place, it could ask the state whether its actions are legitimate and in accordance with its character as state, i.e., it can throw the state back on its responsibilities. Secondly, it can aid the victims of state action. The church has an unconditional obligation to the victims of any ordering of society, even if they do not belong to the Christian community. The third possibility is not just to bandage the victims under the wheel, but to put a spoke in the wheel itself. What transformed Dietrich Bonhoeffer's practice and theology of Christian faith from Volk to Spoke was his encounter with the black church in Harlem. Like Saul on the road to Damascus, something like scales fell from his spiritual eyes when he encountered Christ in the community of the disinherited. In Harlem, Bonhoeffer began learning to embrace Christ hidden in suffering as resistance to oppression. His new awareness of racism gave him unique insight into nationalism as the racialized mixture of God and country embodied in idealized Aryan humanity. Harlan provided what he needed to see the world differently and imagine a different way of being a Christian within it. Sisters and brothers, the reason why I believe Bonhoeffer is so relevant for us right now is because his life shows us what it looks like for a Christian to encounter Christ among the community of the disinherited, to be transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then spend the rest of their lives resisting injustice, even to the point of martyrdom. I believe those aren't just the demands of discipleship in Nazi Germany. I believe those are the demands of discipleship everywhere and for all times. But particularly as we seek to be faithful witnesses of the kingdom of God right here in modern America, it's particularly important for us to focus on Jesus and not theologies that justify injustice or even theologies that create false equivalencies. As we continue in this series, we're going to see how Bonhoeffer's time in Harlem also caused him to reinterpret the Sermon on the Mount and to reinterpret his allegiance to Jesus as central to his understanding of the gospel. Pastor Oshida is also going to preach in this series, which I'm really looking forward to. And I'm super excited to have a special guest preacher to cap off our series. Pastor Jose Humphreys is the pastor of Metro Hope NYC, which is the Covenant Church in Harlem, New York and the author of Seeing Jesus in East Harlem. You aren't going to want to miss that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the only wise God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. To you alone do we owe our life's allegiance. For you demonstrated God's love in your shalom bringing life and teachings, and ultimately in your death and resurrection and sending of the Holy Spirit. Empower your church, we pray, to be faithful witnesses of your kingdom and to resist all injustice. May we encounter you as Saul and Dietrich Bonhoeffer did in the community of the disinherited. And may we spend our lives disrupting systems of injustice like a spoke in the wheel. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. In your name, amen.